Issues in Pakistan's Economy by Akbar Zaidi Introduction Pakistan's economic performance since 1947 has been at times quite spectacular and others nothing but dismal. It failed to maintain the high growth in agriculture and manufacturing which it experienced in the 1960s after a difficult start in the first decade following the independence. In the 1970s, for a host of reasons most beyond the control of the incumbent government, were not even a patch on the 1960s, although surprisingly in the 1970s the economy performed better than it did in the 1950s. Towards the end of the 1970s and for much of the 1980s and at least 1988, the high growth pattern re-emerged, although qualitatively different from the growth performance of the 1960s. The economy in the 1980s seemed to be on a higher plane than that of the 1960s. There were murmurs that perhaps Pakistan had once again returned to the natural growth rate of 6% plus and would now continue where it had left off in the 1968 to 1969. However, just as the 10-year period after 1958 had unraveled, resulting in an appreciable slowing down of the economy, so too did the end of the 10 or so years from about 1978 to 1979 onwards. With the Praetorian electorate charade, starting in 1988, the growth rates of the economy once again fell to the levels rem- reminiscent of the first democratic period of 1971 to 1977. This trend gave rise to suggestions that since growth rates in Pakistan were highest under military regimes and under democracy, the economy had performed particularly poorly. Perhaps one way of achieving high growth rates for the economy would be to maintain military regimes. The, the often quoted examples of South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Indonesia seemed fit to pattern, where authoritarian states had high performing economies. This pattern was repeated again, and the claims made in Pakistan, where the military led government resulted in 7% growth rates between 2002 to 2007. And when the democratically elected government between 2008 to 2013 could manage only 3% growth rate. Yet much of the analysis that examined the economic miracle of East Asia and other countries ignored specific factors including institutional arrangements, the nature of the state, and issues of governance and administration. There are as many differences between East Asian economies as there are similarities and more detailed study of each country shows peculiarities which explain why and how they developed. In fact, Pakistan's growth pattern, at least in the 1960s, also offered some general and particular pointers on how to do development. The period after 1988 brought about an extraordinary sea change in how the world thinks about economics, markets, growth and the development. In the 1960s, the single focus was on growth, with little concern for distribution, equality or any other consequence of growth. Growth was supposed to trickle down from the high income and rich savers and investors to the rest of the population. Now in the 21st century, growth is still important, but is subservient to a development which needs to be participatory, distributive just, sustainable, and environmentally friendly. A growth rate of 7-8%, to while welcome, must be seen in the light of these other important indicators of development. More important, the way growth is to take place now differs substantially from the way economic growth was supposed to take place prior to the mid-1980s. Markets must be efficient and must determine the demand and supply of scarce resources. States and government must stay out of the economy and privatization, openness, liberalization, and globalization. According to conventional wisdom, must determine choices regarding how and where to invest and what to produce. Countries should get their prices right and reduce subsidies and all of the distortions in the economy. Even in the social sectors, the role of the state is supposed to be minimized with private sector initiative leading the way. One of the arguments made in this book is that since 1989, when a package of neoliberal policy reforms was introduced, the economy had performed less well than it had in the past. To a great extent, the Structural Adjustment Program, launched in Pakistan in 1988, under the guidance and direction of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and World Bank, resulted in a visible slowing down in the economy, increasing income inequality, poverty, unemployment, and hastening the process of deindustrialization. Moreover, Pakistan's wider political economy and the failure of its elites had made it dependent on multilateral and bilateral aid. Ironically, although 
The example of South Korea in particular and that of other East Asian economies in general is repeatedly cited for Pakistan to emulate the conditions and policies that were central for the growth of East Asian economies were quite the opposite of those that were propagated post-1988 under the Structural Adjustment Program. As an illustration, we can cite just a handful of policies pursued by South Korea which are believed to be crucial cause of high growth. South Korea was certainly what is called an authoritarian industrialization pattern. With the existence of developmentalist bureaucracy and state and interventionist bureaucracy and state were fundamental to the process of growth that emerged. In Korea, land, landlordism was abolished and an extensive land reform taken. Cheap credit, credit that is directed credit was made available to the private sector at subsidized rate with certain sectors receiving priority treatment. Prices were continuously projected as wrong rather than right. With numerous government imposed controls and restrictions pushing the industrial pattern in a preferred direction. Essentially, it was the state, a particular kind of state, that intervened in the process of economic development and not simply the market, which was responsible for the extraordinary rate of growth observed in South Korea and much of East Asia. Contrast, just the opposite to interventionist and statist policies were recommended for Pakistan in post-1988 structural adjustment period with privatization and market-based policies being advocated as the state would do. One can make the case now that in Pakistan, private sector-led development will be more vulnerable to the market than state-led economic development, resulting in more variable and unsteady outcomes. There is still much merit in the role of the state as developments after the global crisis of 2008 had re-emphasized. While, the, while a comparison of Ayub Zia and Musharraf years show that the decades of the military generals achieved high growth, it also suggests that at the end of the respective decades, the growth performance unraveled because the existing political settlement that per permitted high growth came into conflict and the contradiction with the very structures and systems that it had created. The result was the emergence of popular movements and opposition to the military regimes and the foundation of a kind of a democratic order. The legacies of Zia, 30 years later, Musharraf, 5 years later, after his dismissal, suggests that bad decisions can have permanent, permanent debilitating consequences. This book, this book, after developing a factual and interpretive story about structural transformation, economic growth and development of Pakistan since 1947, ends with the observation that a new economic or political order has emerged in the country. For want of the descriptive for want of the descriptive terms, this new order is called middle class consolidation after 1988. Reasons for it are to be found in 27 chapters of this book. We argue that while as an economic category, the middle class emerged and consolidated itself first in the late 1960s and then in the 1980s, it has only now begun to consolidate itself as a political entity and force. Having said this, it is important to emphasize that nowhere do we glorify this class. If indeed it is one social class for this is no pristine revolutionary and progressive class. This is Pakistan and Pakistan's corrupted, rent-seeking, inefficient, pampered middle class, which is socially conservative and fragmented. Contradictory in nature and in its working includes both highly traditional religious and conservative sections within the social category as well as indigenous and modern groups. It does not see the essential prerequisites of human capital formation and infrastructure development for progress for itself or for the nation in years to come. Pakistan Pakistan's middle class, like all other classes present, has evolved in particular and specific conditions that define what Pakistan is. To expect otherwise that we would necessarily have modern, progressive, educated, forward-looking middle class, as did Europe some centuries ago or Latin America some decades ago, is wishful thinking. The explanation of how state and society has evolved in Pakistan also emphasized the fractured nature of both, which informalization perhaps began which with with informalization perhaps being a key category of analysis